I love where I live. I love living in the flatlands of eastern North Carolina, but I got to admit, I love going to the mountains. And I love when you're riding along possibly the Blue Ridge Parkway or something, and you'll see a sign, Scenic Overlook Ahead. And you know that when you pull off at this, you're going to get a great view. Something exciting, beautiful is going to be there. And to be honest with you, that's the way I view coming to worship. And coming to join together with the family of God, uh, to sing, to worship, to, to study, to pray together. It's just like a, a scenic uh, overlook. It's just something I look forward to. And I know something good is coming from that stop. Even when you do it privately, you study God's Word, you know something's good. You know, but sometimes what we consider scenic or what we've kind of gotten used to can give us a shock. Growing up in Virginia, there was, just right before you got to the Blue Ridge Parkway, there was an overlook that was called Lover's Leap Overlook. And uh, there was a legend there about why it was called Lover's Leap. But I remember as a kid stopping there many times and just looking out over this beautiful area. But I remember one time, and remember this is back in the day, and there wasn't a lot of fences and uh, things like that to protect you. There was a child walking, and she was walking there on the edge, and she started to slide down the side of the, of the overlook, the side of the mountain, and her dad grabbed her by the arm just as she was starting to slide by, and I've never forgotten that. You know, and it just shocked me, made me realize that, you know, we need to pay attention to what's going on around us. You know, there's always something new that can happen, even something that shocks us. You know, that's our series right now, Culture Shock. And it's taken from uh, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus delivered some shocking words. And it shocked the culture, and it still does today, the things that he had to say. They were so countercultural. We started with the Beatitudes last week. You know, Beatitudes means supreme blessing or supreme happiness. And he went total again, totally against every civilization's definition of happiness and how you, uh, how you achieve happiness. And he went with teaching us things like that uh, being able to say you're sorry, that you're sorry for what you've done in your life, sorry for the hurt that's in the world, that you're willing to put others first, that you recognize your own sin in your life and that you're not, you haven't got it all together, but you need God. You know, there's a lot of things there. It's not money, it's not power, it's not position, it's not status, it's none of that that's going to bring us happiness. That was shocking. Do you remember when you were at that age that you didn't think your mom and dad could punish you anymore? You know, maybe, maybe you grew up like I did in the home where they, you know, you had to do something pretty bad, but still they would spank you, give you a whooping. You know, I remember, you know, you get old enough and you think they won't do it anymore. <laughs> They'll surprise you. Mom or dad will surprise you real quick that you're not too old to be punished. I'm not saying God punishes us by his word, but we never get too old too mature, too seasoned as Christians, not to be shocked, not to be warned to take a second look, take a look again at ourselves and look at God, what he requires for us. And that's what I think we're going to see today. We continue on in the Sermon on the Mount. We find ourselves in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. He says this, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> now, you got to trust me here. That was a shocking statement. A shocking statement that when it came, uh, it came to the Pharisees and the scribes, nobody was better at keeping the rules, doing the right things, obeying God. But here he says... You know, that your righteousness has got to be more than them. Why would Jesus say something like that? Well, Pharisee means separatists. Their lives have separated themselves from everybody else because of their obedience. And scribes or teachers of law, they taught it. They, they recorded it meticulously. So they knew the law, the Old Testament law and prophets, like the back of their hand. You see, the people like them, like those rules rule. Rules were the most important thing. So that's what ruled in their lives. Now this has to be pleasing to God, right? That you follow all of God's laws, all of his rules to the very T. 
You don't skip over anything. You would think that would make God very happy with you. They would be pleased with you. Well, because rules rule, that's what you would think. But if you did think that, you would be wrong. Let's look and see what Jesus had to say about Pharisees and scribes and teachers of the law and, uh, and the Sanhedrin ones like that. Matthew 23 is one of the most concise areas to see what Jesus had to say. Look at this. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside will also, the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead man's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous. There's that word again. But on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Matthew 23 is brutal. That's just one section. But that whole chapter, it's just like this. Jesus is just pounding them about their way of living, their rule-keeping, but what they lack. They would think that they lack nothing. But trust me. Go back and read Matthew 23. You're not going to find anything warm and fuzzy about that. And you can understand why Jesus didn't care much for the Pharisees, and they hated Jesus. If you're in the camp of the rules rule, you like Jesus on the outside, but you don't care much for him on the inside. You know why? Because he's calling you calling out, calling you out because you think you're good enough. A Pharisee thinks he can be good enough by just keeping the rules. He's good enough because he's better than you are. Because nobody can be better than they were. You know, it's kind of like the old, old story of two, bear, two people who are on a hiking trail and a grizzly bear comes out and starts chasing them. And they're just running as fast as they can. And the grizzly bear is gaining on And one guy turns to the other and says, you really think we can outrun this bear? And the other guy says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. And I think Pharisees or that attitude of a Pharisee, we think like that. We just got to be better, look better than the people around us. Rules rule people. How does that look in 2021? It would look like a person who goes to church all the time, every time. They put money in the offering plate. They give. They may even volunteer. They live their lives by a series of don't do this and don't do that. And as long as you don't do these things, then everything's right. But how does that work in Jesus' eyes? Not too good. He said our righteousness must be greater than that type of living. Greater than just doing the right things and not doing some things that's on the list. He says that it must be greater than that. So if you were logically thinking, if we find out that rules rule, doesn't please God, and that's not going to be enough righteousness to get us into heaven. So the opposite seems like it will be true, that we go by the no rules, that we become a person who doesn't go by rules. You know, Jesus' message, to be honest, was a little bit confusing. You know, think back. Jesus came, and he points out to everybody their sin. And that can make you feel bad because somebody pointing out your sin makes you feel bad. But then Jesus made people feel so good because he pointed out not only did you have sins, but God loves you. God wants you. And you looked at Jesus' life, how he lived. He didn't spend his time around the Pharisees. He spent his time around the outcasts, around the, the ones who knew they were sinners. Jesus made it clear that sin was a problem, 
But loving God and the love of God could be greater than that, was greater than that. So rules don't matter, right? Well, let's go back and look at what he said right before he said what we read in, in verse 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to, to fulfill them. So, are you, so if you are of the no rules thinking, sorry, Jesus just blew that out of the water. He keeps going in verse 18. He says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will, be, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, obviously, as we read through the Bible and we get to know God's story, we see some th that some things have been accomplished. Jesus has come. So looking forward to the Messiah, Messiah has already come. And we see that some of the Old Testament laws about food and, and dietary and making animal sacrifices, they're done away with because God has said all people are welcome. I've removed all the barriers. And there's no need to make an animal sacrifice because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. But overall, if you're thinking the no rules is the way to go, you've missed it. Jesus keeps going, verse 19. He says, anyone who breaks one of these, one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness, I'm going to read verse 20 again, your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. You will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, we can't avoid God's rules, God's laws, God's commandments, because they, they help to mold us. They help to shape us. They point out what is right and what is wrong. They point out what sin is. They help build a foundation of being a moral person, an ethical person, even a person who looks to love other people. But we cannot fool ourselves into thinking that that is where our righteousness comes from. But you know, one of the biggest problems, one of the early problems in the early church, particularly the Gentile churches, was that they adopted somehow a rule in their life or a philosophy, an attitude that said, okay, we've been free from sin, so therefore we are free from everything. And although they had become Christians, they began, to, they began to live lives like they didn't have to keep any rules, that they, they could just live any way they wanted to. And Paul and Peter and uh, others had to write and correct them on that. Well, let me tell you something. That philosophy is still alive today in the church. It's alive in our church. How do we get to the place that we think that it doesn't matter how we live once we become a Christian, once we're saved? My friends, we're still guided by the Word of God. We are to operate within the parameters of what God's Word says. So when God's Word says, do not get drunk, you know what? That's what it means. But why is... Why is drunkenness and partying such a huge part of people's lives? Yes, Christian people's lives. How come it, the way the drinking habits pretty much mirror the rest of society? How come the Bible teaches us about how sexual relations are to be handled? That's just to be between a husband and a wife. And there's not supposed to be uh, multiple partners outside of marriage. It's just the husband and wife. How come we can look and, and read where God's word says that you are to be married, but yet over 50%, I think it's like 60% of Christian people say it's okay to live together. I don't know how we get to that part. How do we get to the part that we don't think that our language matters, that we can use cursing, that we can gossip, that we can lie, that we can speak with such hate in our hearts and we can tear people down but yet the Bible tells us to be controlled and loving in what we say how do we get there how do we get to the place where 
We think that time for God doesn't matter anymore. It's just time for what I want to do or time for what I want to do with my family that matters. How do we get to that place where God, but God specifically said, you set aside this time for you and your family to be together with the rest of your Christian family. You meet together. How did we get to that place? If you're doing those things, you're wrong. But just because I might not be doing those things doesn't mean, listen to me, doesn't mean I'm necessarily right. The no rules, the rules rule, doesn't, isn't the answer. So what is it? What does Jesus do when neither of these seem to be the answer to righteousness? Jesus raised the bar. You go, what? Yeah, Jesus shocked them by raising the bar. He raised the expectations if you become a follower of Jesus Christ. He raised them. He didn't lower them. He didn't get away with them. Or do away with them. And Jesus goes on in Matthew 5. You need to take the time to read it. And he takes some situations and points out how we're to be different. How he goes deeper into the subject. For instance, he says, he says, I do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anybody that looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery now. And you're going, the men in the audience are going, what? That's impossible. And he goes on and he talks about how we handle divorce and how you, you keep your word, how you don't take revenge. He talks about loving your enemy, giving to the needy, not making a show of it. Now, all of these things the Pharisees had strict regulations about. For instance, I'm just going to read one of the places in Matthew 5. Verses 21 and 22 says this. You have heard that it said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Good advice. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Jesus raised the bar. See, no Pharisee would say, well, it's okay to murder somebody. And they would never do that. But they may not have a problem with tearing a person down, ostracizing them, cutting them down, pointing out their sin, telling them they would never be good enough, telling them that they could never please God because of who they were. They would have no problem with destroying someone's life just like they did with Jesus. Rules rule, not good enough. No rules, <laughs> that's not matching up with what Jesus said. But Jesus rules, not Jesus more rules, but Jesus reigning, ruling in our life. That's his answer. That's how Jesus says you will attain the righteousness. He said, you go to the heart of the matter. You change from the inside out, not the outside in. This can change everything, completely changes why rules matter in the first place. Rules will never make us righteous. They can guide us, they can help mold us, but it's Jesus who makes us righteous. To live according to the new way, the kingdom way, it would take a drastic change on the inside. The Pharisees refused to see Jesus in the scriptures. They were not willing to pay the price to follow him. So they stayed the way they were, looking good and cool on the outside, but dead on the inside. Jesus rules or reigns works. It's the only way. It, you know why the other ways will never work? Rules, rules, or no rules, because they'll never be enough. It'll never be enough. I read the illustration of somebody, imagine you built your beautiful dream home. You know, you build your house, and there's nothing spared on the cost, and it's the, the granite, and it's the hardwood floors, and it's just everything wonderful about it. And you, it's a two-story house. It is awesome. But you either don't plan to, or you don't have enough money to put a roof on it. How good is that house? 
with no roof. I'm talking with nothing there. How long will it serve you? How long will you be able to live there? It's no good. Or the illustration that you have a, you buy a, a, a $10 million yacht and, uh, and you're just going to sail around the world. You're going to do everything. And it is an awesome yacht. And you invest in the best anchor that can be bought because you want, when you want to stop and, and rest and, and keep that boat, uh, boat stable as you sit in a harbor somewhere, that you want to let the anchor down and know that you're secure. So you buy the best anchor you can. But when you let the anchor chain out, it doesn't reach the floor of the ocean. What good is an anchor if it doesn't reach the floor, the ground? It's not good to you. It's never going to be enough, no matter what anchor you have, if it's not enough to anchor you. All of that is exactly what Jesus is challenging us to do. It's the same as if we were sitting on that hillside 2,000 years ago. He's challenging us to let Jesus rule in our lives. God's law and our, and our rules have given, given thousands a year ago were, given, were not given to replace God. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what, that's what people do today that they follow rules and it replaces God. God never intended that. He wanted the laws to draw them closer to him, to see the need for him, to expose the areas of our lives where we needed to make adjustments. The rules were to draw us closer to God. And that goal was always the same. And it's the same with Jesus. That Jesus came to this world, sent of the Father, to to save us from our sins so that we would believe when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he would become everything to us. That our righteousness is found in the work of Jesus. Rules, rules, no rules. Jesus rules. On April 21st, 1980, a woman by the name of Rosa Ruiz crossed the line and was announced the winner of the 1980 female winner of the Boston Marathon. And all of the hoopla and the celebration took place like it always does because she was a relative unknown and she pops up and wins the Boston Marathon. But almost immediately some suspicion began to arise because no one had ever heard of her. As they began to check some things out, some people said, I don't remember seeing her. I, don't, I never ran with her. They began to check some of the checkpoints and said, we didn't see her come by here. And so all of this suspicion began to arise. And then finally, somebody came forward, two men came forward and said, she came out of the crowd where we were standing a half a mile from the end of the marathon and started running. So eight days after she was declared the winner, the crown was taken away from her. Yet she would not back down from her claim. She claimed she won the Boston Marathon. She would not back down against all of the evidence. No way was she going to admit that she cheated. She never ran in any other marathon. She said she would to prove that she was a marathon runner. She moved back to Florida. There she had a, a tough life where she was arrested for embezzling, spent time in prison for that. Time in prison for getting caught in a drug deal. And she passed away in 2019 at the age of 66. Never having publicly admitted that she cheated to win the Boston Marathon. You know, as I read the story about Rosie, you know, we can think of a lot of people we know who want to finish the race. They want to be counted on the side of God. They want to be counted as righteousness, as righteous, but they don't want to get in the race. They don't want to pay the price. They don't want to work hard at it. Whether it's rules or submitting and surrendering your life to it, they just don't want it. They just want to collect the prize. When we get to the end of the race, will there be evidence that we even ran, that we tried, that we gave our lives to Christ? Will there be evidence for that? Or just claim you, the run, claim you were a runner but didn't do anything about it? 
I love what 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 says about running the race. He said, Paul said, I've run, I fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of, you remember what that next word was? The crown of righteousness. That's what we've been talking about. Jesus said you must be more righteous than the Pharisees. He said the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. That's where we'll find our righteousness. It's letting Jesus rule, Jesus reign in our lives. Don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're sitting in the crowd of the rules rule, and that's just how you've lived your whole Christian life. Or you're new to this, and you just think if you do a few things on the outside, I can do all the no rules things, and everything's going to be okay. Or are you striving to live a life where Jesus rules in you? You know which one. It's a way to righteousness. You know the one that God says he accepts. And I pray that for you today. God bless you. See you next time.